I've only ever lived in this one room. One of a thousand casual statements that my then 14-year-old daughter had said to me over the years. But this statement was a wake-up call. It was an invitation for me to take stock in my life. Now, I believe that there are an infinite number of moments that if we are awake to them and acknowledge them, they can shape who we become. It's where we can create our best life, which I believe begins where our comfort zone ends. Now, my first memory of living on an edge was when we moved to an abandoned farm down an abandoned road next to an abandoned field that had only just been abandoned by porcupines. <laughs> It was the early 1970s. This is the picture of the farm. 200-year-old post and beam farmhouse that my parents bought for $18,000 in the early 70s. They had a dream of living a sustainable life, a purposeful life. My mom grew vegetables and canned them for the long winter months. My dad, he fell hardwood in the grove, hauled them out of the woods with his workhorses. We heated the house with this wood. We had no running water, no electricity, no telephone, and no television. Well, that's not quite true. We had a television, it was about this big. It ran on a car, car battery. When Tom Brokaw got smaller, we got closer. Yes. In a way, this was living on the edge, but it was also just my life. It was the way I knew how to live. It gave me purpose. It gave us purpose. However, purpose wasn't clear to me. What purpose meant wasn't clear to me at an intellectual level when I was three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. But it was in these woods and on this farm that I became curious about myself, about ecosystems, about the environment. Now, I don't know about you, but on our farm, we had to be resourceful. If I wanted a chair or a desk, my dad would hand me a bag of 10-penny nails, a hammer, and a saw. There's the pile of wood. Have at it. There was no easy manual, like one, two, three steps or anything like this. No. Nope. But my curiosity became my superpower, my tool of sorts. So I had a hunger to learn, and for some reason, I was also unafraid of failing. I did not mind failing at all. I was just so unafraid, it just didn't matter. I have a lot of stories that I could share about my failures, but the one that comes to mind today, as I stand here and talk with you, is the one when I was trying to help my dad out by bush hogging the back field. Drove it all over the field and right into the pond. What a wet, hot, mechanical mess. A lot of trial and error, but that was okay. I was living life. So since my early childhood, I've consistently tried to live on my edges and to challenge myself, to stay curious. And this journey has not always been pretty. Nope. Take the first time I tried to sit for a 10-day Vipassana meditation. I don't know if any of you ever tried that before. After two days, my mind it nearly imploded. I had to leave. I got anxious, scared. I felt confused. It's okay. I learned. I learned about myself. I learned about my edges. Boy, did I learn about my edges and the work I have to do in my life. But it's out on the trail, running 50 and 100 miles, that I go deep. I go really deep. It's at this place where I'm really uncomfortable. I learn about my mind and about my body and how I can push myself. This curiosity informs me every day. It informs me at work and it informs me in life. There are two more tools I want to share with you as well. So when I transitioned from high school into college, I was on the hook to pay for a lot of my college, which was totally fine. So I picked up a job in a sailboat. Now, this sailboat, the need to earn money brought me to the sailboat, but the curiosity to sail across an ocean, that brought me to something I call community and learning in community. Now, on this sailboat, when you're thousands of miles from sea, you sure need to rely on one another, right? You need to be in community with one another, to trust one another. So what I learned at sea was that, was power of connection 
and trust. Community is the second tool in my tool belt. So I've shared with you at the top of the hour here what my daughter said to me, her observation, but I've not yet shared what came after that. I haven't shared that within just a few weeks, I quit my job as an executive creative director. I convinced my wife to quit her job. We pulled our kids out of school, and we went on a 282-day service trip. Our first volunteer opportunity was at a place called Yoga and Sport with Refugees in the Eastern Aegean Sea on the island of Lesvos. So I signed up to be the men's running coach. My wife and kids cared for the women and children. Now, we decided to consistently you know, swim upstream, and we did this in a conscious manner, to go to our edges and to live and lean into community. Now, when we did, the community around us supported us in our endeavors. Our sister's friends became my kids' tutor, remote tutor. Our friends in the local community packed our boxes and the moving truck. Now, the true power of community I didn't feel the true power of community until we actually put our boots on the ground with the refugees. These were young men and young women who had walked literally thousands of miles for freedom, in fear of persecution from their governments. I should step, by, step back for a moment and say, when we quit our jobs and made this conscious decision to move in a different direction, well, we did this also for our girls. 14 and 11 at the time, so that they would have a seminal moment in their lives, much like I had a seminal moment in my life, living on a farm or sailing across an ocean. At this point, I must say that I'm not a doctor, I'm not a therapist, and nothing really qualifies me to be a good volunteer for refugees. But that didn't stop us. Running helped my mental health, my overall well-being, and it was the least I could do to help these people in need. It was the least we could do. These people were living through a crisis that we will never likely ever experience in our lifetimes. So, as I mentioned, I was the running coach. And as it would turn out, with each step around the track, more and more refugees would arrive. On the second night, so many refugees arrived that the executive director asked them to sit in the stands. I stood silent. I couldn't believe it. We couldn't believe this, and we couldn't accept this. We hadn't come this far to let them sit in the stands and not belong to something that they wanted to belong to that would be good for their health. So that night, as we drove home from the track, tears rolling down our faces tears rolling down our faces. Our family had a goal of raising $10,000 in two weeks for these refugees so that we could buy shoes and socks and underwear, water bottles. So I must back up for a second and say, before we left on this trip, Alex Colmer, the CEO of VidMob, pulled me aside. He'd heard about what we were doing as a family. Our service trip, you're doing what? You're taking your family on a service trip? This is incredible. He explained to me that he had just started a 501c3 called VidMob Gives and he wanted to pressure test it on our family. <laughs> Let's see if it works. So I said, uh, yeah, thanks, but no thanks. I want to put down the phone. I want to close the computer and see the world with my eyes. Alex said, no problem. But if there's ever a need, please call me. I'm here for you. That night, that second night, there was a need. I called Alex, explained the situation, and he said, that's why we created VidMob Gives. Let's go. So we wrote a script, we shot a video. I was assigned a project manager in New York, a editor in South Africa, and I was in Greece. Within three days, the video was done, and posted to our socials. Now, I am no influencer, not at all. <laughs> Very few followers. But five days later, we'd raised $10,000. On the 13th day of our two-week campaign, we hit $20,000. Boom. We bought socks. We bought shoes. We bought, we, we bought shorts and underwear and water bottles. We even covered the tent on the yoga and sport facility. Pretty exciting. 
So our friends received things that we all take for granted. They had a spot on the team. We were slowly building a band of brothers. They were part of something good. It felt amazing to us to serve, to give back. It's also to my amazement that there were so many people around the world that wanted to belong to something good. And I'd remembered, I'd known and donated money before, but I'd never really put my feet on the ground, my boots on the ground to make a difference in people's lives. Walking side by side, these refugees changed my life and changed my family's life forever. Surprisingly, this is now my life calling. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. So exploring our edges is not about jumping into adventure eyes closed. Far from it. Yes, there is lots of uncertainty for us that we experienced, but there was absolute clarity in our quest. We were looking to grow. We were looking to be citizens of the world, to serve, to have a purpose. So I reflected for years now about what my life was like before the trip. It was hollow, directionless, without purpose. On the trip, we were living on the edge. We had an abundance of curiosity, a hunger for community, and a clarity of purpose. Clarity of purpose, the third tool in my tool belt that I want to share with you today. Think about your life. Are you clear on your purpose? Are you really clear on your purpose? Why you're here? Do you know where you're headed? As we sat on our journey, people pulled me aside and said, Burr, you've got to get really clear on your purpose and encourage me to write down something that they called your life manifesto. And I want to share it with you today. My life's manifesto is to live fully with purpose. This means I will wake each day with the enthusiasm and curiosity for living life, and I will rest each night with the satisfaction of having made the absolute most of my precious time. Why? Because I want to live. I really, really want to live. I want to love. And I want to know love. I want to live on my edges, for it is there that I am most fully alive. I want to enrich my soul and the souls of others. I want to live with less. For the less I have, the more I will have shared money, knowledge, and time. And from having shared, the more I will know what it means to be a human being living on planet Earth. And then when this dance finally comes to an end, I will own no regrets. I will be wrung dry, having left everything out on the field of life. And as I lay down, in a, under the, in a soft meadow under the summer sun, one last time I will look up at the infinite blue sky and know that I live the life I chose to live. So this manifesto, I use it as a tool. If I've had a tough day, I will ask myself that night, did I live with less? Did I love with my whole heart? Do I have any regrets? Have I made the most of my precious time. Now, I am not going to stand up here. I won't stand up here and say that I nail every day because I don't. You can ask my wife. You can ask my parents <laughs> or my kids. It's too hard to do. But it's because of this manifesto that I am able to have the specificity in my life and understand what I did well and what I still need to work on every day. Our best life begins at our comfort, where our comfort zone ends, at our edges with curiosity, community, community, and clarity. It's where the fairy dust is made and the magic happens. Tonight, at home, I encourage you to write your manifesto. What's your true north? How can you align this with this? Your manifesto doesn't have to be long. Maybe it's a few words, a sentence, or a paragraph. It just has to be true to you. Day in and day out, around the pillars that you decide. So exploring our edges changed everything for us and our family. Our trip took us to Lesbos, Greece, to Nepal, to Laos, Cambodia, and Guatemala. But the biggest challenge didn't occur until we returned home. What was it, you might ask? It was committing to staying on my edge. 
while digging into building a new career in a new life. So I'd been gone a year, just about. We had come home with no house, no job. But after having spent about 25 years in advertising and pressure testing VidMob Gives in the platform, I'm now starting my fifth year as the executive director of VidMob Gives. I've had the honor of helping amplify hundreds of nonprofits all around the world, and we use our tool, our platform, to do this. These NPOs work tirelessly to make the world a better, safer, kinder, gentler place. So doing this work is the power of my purpose. My daughters continue to explore their edges, my wife as well. We believe so much in using business as a force for good, it's become one of our values that VidMob gives. It's a massive unlock. It's helped us attract new talent and retain the folks that are there. So we're also working to democratize creativity while building capacity for nonprofits. We do this by aligning to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, all 17 goals, of which we've worked against all 17. So my family's imperfect video, very imperfect video, raised $20,000. We pressure tested VidMob Gives, and today we've created millions and millions of dollars for nonprofits around the world. I believe it's at our edges that we discover our place, our role, and our purpose in this world. I ask you today, where is your edge? Are you ready to feel the magic when you step outside your comfort zone? Are you ready to find the power of your purpose? Thank you. Thank you.